Thank you for joining us on another episode of Latter Gay Stories Podcast. I'm your host, Kyle Ashworth, and you are at the intersection of sexuality and reality, where it meets at the streets of LGBTQ Avenue and LDS Street. But this podcast episode will be just a little bit different, and you'll see why. We're excited to have you here, excited for uh, our many followers and fans who have made the Latter Gay Stories podcast the premier LGBTQ LDS podcast in the space. This is now our 10th season, which means 10 years of podcast episodes just like this. So thank you. Thank you for, for following. Thank you for sharing. Thank you for participating uh, in the podcast and helping us to build bigger and stronger bridges between a religious community and the LGBTQ community. It's through sharing these episodes, through interacting with these episodes and support of podcast episodes like this, that we're able to create more visibility and more discussion around topics like this. Now, I'm really excited about today's podcast episode because it is just a little bit different. It's not as Mormon, not as Latter-day Saint as we typically talk about, but still birds of a feather-ish. It's one of those podcast episodes that still talk about the many intricacies of religion and sexuality and identity and the things that um, are so important and the things that we talk about uh, so frequently on this podcast episode. So uh, for those of you who are watching on our video version uh, through YouTube or Facebook, we invite you uh, to follow along and participate in the live chat. If you have questions, uh, comment, something stands out or uh, is interesting to you, <clears throat> let's chat about it. Let's talk about it um, in the live chat. And if you are listening on an audio version through one of our many audio podcast players like Google, uh, iTunes, the Apple products, uh, iHeartRadio, or one of Stitcher, one of the many other ones, we invite you to subscribe to this channel wherever you're listening to us. One uh, cool little tip, those who listen to the, podio, uh, the audio podcasts on the audio side always get the episodes first. So subscribe to this channel wherever you're catching it. With all of that aside and without uh, further ado, I want to welcome to the podcast, Ashley Ryan. Ashley, welcome. Hi, thank you for having me. I'm so excited. LDS, yes. <laughs> <laughs> We're super excited to have you uh, here as well because... As I kind of alluded, um, and we'll, as we get into your story a little bit, mm -hmm. this isn't the typical Mormon story. Uh, you did not grow up or was not raised as a Latter-day Saint. No. Um, but you didn't serve a Mormon mission, um, but you did kind of have some mission experience within your faith. And so yes. we'll, we'll talk a, a little bit about that. Um, but you are, you're into some really fun, cool stuff that I want to talk about a little later in the podcast as well. Yeah. You're, you're casting and filming for some LGBTQ uh, themed um, reality shows. Yes. You are dotting all over the country um, on a comedy routine, um, very involved in this space. So some super cool things that you're, you're doing in your world. Um, so with that kind of on the back burner, give the audience or tell the audience a little bit about who Ashley is. Yeah. Uh, so my name's, yeah, I'm Ashley. I am a stand-up comedian uh, living in the sunny Palm Springs, California. Uh, very different from the 16 degree mountain that I'm on right now in a crop top. Uh, not as comfortable, but- hey, welcome to Utah. Yeah. <laughs> I dress the same there as I do here, so. Uh, <laughs> um, but yeah, anyway, I've lived to Palm Springs. I moved there during the pandemic. Um, definitely a pandemic purchase type thing. Left LA, fled the city. Um, it's been beautiful. Um, just sold my house. And so um, I'll be homeless in a, in a week, I guess. I have to find somewhere. I don't know even know what city I'm going to move in. I'm like, new city, new state. I have no idea. Hey, Utah's but, full. And so many people from <laughs> California are coming to Utah. Yeah. Well, well my family uh, lives here, actually, um, up in North Salt Lake. So um it's nice to visit uh they have a 2000 square foot basement that's unfinished i could totally live down there but um they need to finish it like you know we need some chandeliers for me but <laughs> uh anyway more about me um i work as a casting director um i'm also flipping houses now uh first i flip gender and now i flip houses you know pretty similar you just change the plumbing um and also i'm transgender so yeah that's a little bit me in a nutshell super cool um, and I want to dive into uh, I want to dive into all of that because yeah. I think there's so many questions, so many things that we can learn. Um, this will be a really just a fascinating, fun um, interview. And if you're open to some hardball, just 
off the wall questions, maybe some no holds barred. Uh, we can kind of dispel some myths, talk about what it is like to be transgender, some of the things you ran into, mm -hmm. um, some of the uh, maybe pieces of nuggets of information for those who are listening to this episode that are in the beginning processes of of transitioning and trying to better understand who and what they are. I think those are all right. probably some great spaces where you can lend uh, uh -huh. some resource. I mean, being transgender is like being like God, you know, the Trinity, the Father, the Son, Holy Spirit, you know, I, I go both ways. You got it. <laughs> all right. So let's start with, um, let's start with growing up. Um, what was life like in Texas growing up in a Lutheran family? Uh, yeah. So growing up in Texas, I went to a really small religious school all the way from preschool through high school, the same school. Um, you know, all the sports I played were through that school. It was also my church. Um, and so I was super sheltered growing up. I didn't have like any friends really outside of uh, school or the church. It was mostly the same people. So maybe I had like about 60 people uh, my age range, my grade that I would like, you know, associate with and hang out with. Um, and yeah, we'd re read the Bible every day in class. Um, then I'd go to youth group and like the summer camps I would go to were usually like Christian themed. And so I was very just like stuck in this like bubble and very sheltered growing up. Sheltered. It's, it's hard to be when we talk about being sheltered, it's kind yeah. of relative, like, um, shell, you, you can kind of look back and say, I was sheltered because as you grew older, you learned more about the world and learned about mm -hmm. what the world looked like outside of your little bubble. Um, so maybe, maybe that's a lead in to say, um, at what point did you realize I'm different? There's something about me that's not like everyone here. Yeah. I mean, I, I always felt different growing up. Um, I mean, even as far back as in preschool, um, I would get like in trouble for playing with certain toys or for, um, trying to play with the girls. And sometimes the girls would be not very friendly and they'd be like, oh, you have cooties. You can't play with us. And I would get hurt and then, um, you know, cause a ruckus. And then I'd always get in trouble and they'd be like, you need to play with the boys. Like, and like, I get reprimanded and like, they'd be like, sit me down with the boys and I would just look at them and they'd be like playing with like the guns or swords or whatever, like, you know, violent things like boys in Texas like to do. And I would just be like, wow, this is really weird and awkward. And so I would watch them and then try to study what they do to try to be normal and try to uh, listen to the elders and stuff. Um, so that I, I noticed at an early age that I was different. And then um, even like going to pre or going to kindergarten, um, my mom bought me this Lisa Frank backpack that I really wanted. And then when we got home, my dad got so mad and like, was just like yelling, like in front of me, like, oh, like everyone's going to make fun of him. Uh, I was like him back then. Um, <laughs> and, uh, like it made me really self-conscious about what other people thought at a very early age. And so I always kind of knew something was different. What, yeah. what about what age were you? Um, that was kindergarten. So I would say around like seven or eight, I think. Yeah. So in turn, I think this brings up a good uh, opportunity to talk about parental support. If your mom's buying you, um, what society would deem as a girly backpack. Um, did you feel like mom didn't mind, um, breaking gender norms? Uh, was dad the more rigid or were you old enough to even make that delineation or figure out that there was a side there? Um, I wasn't old enough to even realize like what was happening back then. Um, my mom was just artsy and just very supportive. And my dad was like the jock, like asshole, like, you know, <laughs> type one. And they ended up getting divorced. Um, he, he was Republican. She was Democrat. So I grew up in a mixed family, I guess. <laughs> but, uh, um, yeah. All around. So, so mom, um, so your kindergarten, you're kind of growing and and trying to better understand who and what you are yeah any pivotal points that kind of finally break this shell open when you start putting feelings and experiences into language mm -hmm. yeah so uh, like i said I, I was super sheltered in the fact that um, i was an only child I, I didn't have brothers and sisters and so i really didn't 
understand uh, differences between gender until I was like maybe in middle school. I was like really late to the game. Um, I, like I didn't understand like what sex was. Um, I didn't, I had never heard of the word gay or lesbian. I actually remember the first time I heard the word lesbian was in middle school and I kept forgetting what the word was. So I'd ask my friend, I'd be like, what's that word you said about like when two girls like each other? Like that's how sheltered I was. Um, I never actually met a gay person um, who was openly gay until I was 19 and left Texas to go to um, California in college. And so that's that's when I, when I say I'm sheltered, like that's like I would lived in a bubble. Um, of course, I, I did know gay people, but um, who, you know, came out as gay later in life. Uh, but I never had met someone um, who was openly gay. That was like so taboo um, back then. Um, but yeah, w when I first had uh, realizations about um, that I was different or what I, I mean, I always knew I was different. Um, when I first heard the word gay, I thought that might have described me because um, I knew I liked boys. But, um, you know, again, through, I grew up uh, religious in the Lutheran faith and, you know, they taught us ways, um, you know, if you, you ever have a temptation of any kind to, you know, just start thinking of the Pledge of Allegiance. So if you're having thoughts like, oh, I might like guys, you just like, sidetrack your mind and you don't allow your brain to have those thoughts so it's like a form of denial of yourself um so i'd have a lot of that but anyway getting to your question um i first heard the word transgender um i believe it was in sixth or seventh grade and it was because some kids had seen oprah and they had a transgender person on oprah and um it might have been like someone like a Jazz Jennings type. So it was like a, a kid who like transitioned. And so people were talking about this at school. And when I heard that word, I was like, I instantly knew, I had no idea that transgender existed. I didn't know that w was something that was possible. Um, and I, I like had like my heart maybe skipped a beat when I first heard that. I was like, <gasps> I like couldn't breathe. I, I was standing by my lockers when it happened and I was just like so nervous. I was like, oh my gosh, wait, like, is that what I am? And then I was like, no, 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 no. And then, um, you know, just denial, denial, denial. This is the point where you start reciting the Pledge of Allegiance. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> exactly. Um, uh, yeah, I can't even think of the Pledge of Allegiance right now. I haven't said it in quite some time, but. Uh. <laughs> See, in Mormonism, uh, it's, we don't recite the Pledge, Pledge of Allegiance. We're supposed to sing a hymn. Yeah. When you have a bad thought, okay. you sing a hymn and that will distract you. And what, you what hymn did, what was your go-to hymn? Is that what made you gay? Because you just kept thinking of him instead of him. Yeah. So it's the, H I M. there is a, uh, there's a great Mormon hymn called come, come ye saints. So that probably was the mm, great one. That okay. Every gay Latter day Saint would sing. Yeah. I mean, that could be a, a rap song too, you know, <laughs> oh who's gosh. that rapper cupcake. She could sing, sing that. <laughs> Um, yeah, we, we, we definitely rap to the Mormon Tabernacle Choir. That's yeah. Our, that's our <laughs> interesting, interesting that, uh, the Pledge of Allegiance is it. Um, so you, you make this correlation, um, because of an Oprah episode, which is fascinating. Yeah. <laughs> um, anything in the religious community, um, was there anything that came out of, uh, the Lutheran church? that spoke specifically against or for or even neutral regarding um, transgender individuals in the church or in communities? Yeah, um, not anything specific toward transgender people. Um, it was never really talked about. Um, we didn't have transgender people like in Texas or in our circle at all. No one in our church had ever um, really transitioned. Um, there was one person who maybe started to go down that route. I don't know if they are trans now, um, but we never really even used that word to describe them. We just would um, call them gay. Like gay was like the umbrella term for all of that. And so, um, you know, we were taught that gay was wrong. Um, we did have a teacher in high school who would show us these like documentaries about um, gay people who were saved and fixed and they were like, you know, having gay sex and like in gay relationships. And then they went to conversion and they were saved and it was all magic. So we did have like, you know, that really weird sense of, uh, you know, try to uh, brainwashing, I, I guess I would call it now. Um, and yeah, it's just like wrong in so many ways, but, um, th that was what I, um, th uh, that was what I was taught. And then also I should mention too, um, 
I didn't understand the difference between a gay person and a transgender, um, you know, who you go to bed with um, instead of who you go to bed as or, you know. Um, so I thought that, um, I thought most gay people were transgender because, you know, the way they'd act feminine. I thought most, and they just, I thought most gay people were transgender. They just didn't, um, you have the confidence to actually go and transition. You know, being trans was way worse on the totem pole than being gay was. So I thought, um, yeah, I had that misconception as well. I think that's a super great so. opportunity <laughs> to talk about the, yeah. these misconceptions because there is a difference between sexual orientation and mm -hmm. gender identity. Yeah. And sometimes we bulk those into their same basket and someone who uh, transitions uh, in terms of gender identity or expression doesn't necessarily um, have to come out as gay mm -hmm. or lesbian. Right. Um, and so maybe let's just talk about just in a minute or two, yeah. the difference between sexual orientation and gender identity. Yeah. And so that, that came up for me actually when I went to college and I finally did end up, um, you know, joining one of the little gay meeting groups, um, LGBT uh, meeting groups. And uh, they were going around in a circle just talking. And uh, this one gay guy was telling a story of how um, someone was like, oh, you don't want to be women. Like, why do gay guys like act like women if they don't want to be women? And he's like, uh, of course, I'm a man. I love being a man, blah, blah, blah. And everyone started laughing. Um, because of the story he was telling. And I was like, wait, why is this funny? Wait, do uh, gay people don't want to be women? Like, I was so confused because um, I still hadn't really talked about myself or my feelings at that point. And I was mostly there just to listen and, you know, try to make friends and, um, you know, maybe have a boyfriend or something like that. Um, and so, yeah, that's when I really learned that, um, I, I had a bunch of misconceptions and I had no education about, uh, what gender identity, um, even was. So, and where does someone in your shoes, yeah. um, I mean, you, you're now, I mean, an adult yeah. in, at a university uh -huh. moved away from home. Where does someone in your shoes go to find an education like that to try to better understand who and what you are? Uh, that's a good question. I, I really didn't, I, I didn't have um, a source for that. Um, I, I did try to sign up for um, the LGBT, you know, gender identity classes at my school, but they were impossible to get into because I think everyone across the country, they uh, go to California to like be gay and <laughs> they all want to take these classes. And so I could never get into them. Um, and so I, I was very much in uh, the denial phase still in college because I just thought transgender was the worst thing you could possibly be because um, you can't just be it like you have to uh, do all these things you have to you know go to court you know change your gender change your name appear in front of a judge pay all this money you know if you decide to go the surgery route um, all this money that you do not have as a college student um, and so there's like even a delay to it if you if you don't have the resources and everything but um yeah i was very much in, in denial and I, I was on this path to um attempt to try to live as a gay male um and see if, if i could get away with that and if you know these feelings would go away and so um it i i never had a boyfriend until i graduated college i was working and I thought that, you know, if I had a boyfriend, a job, everything, um, like to make me happy that I, I could be happy. And if I had like a, I was still like trying to build up my body and gain muscle mass at that point. I was like on all, the, I was on like a 5,000 calorie diet, uh, to try to be like a man. I was like, if I can be the best man and just have everything, um, I will be happy. But then it was through that relationship when I did have everything and I was like, wait, I'm not happy. And I still, the feelings are still there. I'm not being myself. I'm being fake. I'm playing a role, um, trying to be someone who my father wanted me to be, um, who uh, I thought that society wanted me to be, um, and that I realized I, um, I needed to change. So. Well, how did your family... Um Actually, before we hit our hit the family yeah. discussion, because that probably comes after you start making uh, mm -hmm. some public decisions to come out. 
Um, yeah. I just want to know, I want to talk about um, dating just a little bit. Yeah. Because uh, you're dating in a weird position. You're, you're, you're dating um, not as you necessarily reflect um, mm -hmm. on the outside. Yeah. Um, you're, you're, you're dating according to your orientation. Right. You're dating men. Um, so, but you say you didn't start dating until, or didn't have a boyfriend until school, uh, after, or th in college, right? Uh, until after, after college. college. Yeah, I was really trying to find a boyfriend in college, but um, actually at my college, it was still, um, it, it was Chapman University in Orange County. Uh, so still like a little bit conservative of that Orange County bubble. Um, so there was actually a lot of people um, who weren't out yet even in, in college. And so the dating pool wasn't really that big and we didn't have all the resources that we have now, like YouTube, um, you know, Instagram wasn't a thing yet. It was just a thing you like edit pictures to post onto Facebook or something with. Um, and I, I grinder had like just started to come about. And so it was just very like archaic to connect with people. And I, you know, that was kind of, uh, my introduction to dating and, I it's still maybe like a little bit shameful um, going on dates. I think I, I remember going on a date with someone um, in Texas. Maybe I was home for spring break um, or something. And I went over to their place and I think we met through on Grindr. And I went over to their place and they had a friend there. And I was like, oh my God, like, do they know how we met? Like, I was like trying to act like we didn't just meet on Grinder because I was so embarrassed and self-conscious about it. Um, and I, I guess still trying to just even hide the fact of my sexuality at that point. And, you know, this friend was their like a gay bestie. And so um, long story short, um, they like ended up in trying to introduce me to makeup. And they're like, oh, do you want to try putting makeup on? And I was like, no, why would a man try to do something like that? I was like shutting it down, but deep inside, I like really wanted to try it. But long story short, we um, both went on a date and um, we like ended up hooking up. And um, then we, we've just stayed in contact and we both ended up transitioning together. Oh, and so amazing. she's my trans uh, sister now. Yeah. <laughs> Crazy how things um, work out. Sorry, I feel like I'm going off on all these tangents. Um, but then to bring us to kind of the next step, um, of, you know, kind of confronting myself. So it was through, um, the relationship with my first boyfriend that I started to realize, Hey, like I need to, I'm still dealing with these issues. Um, and at the same time in my career, I was working, um, at a, a reality TV studio and my job was to create reality shows and pitch them to, uh, TV networks. And so, um, my boss came in the office one day and she's like, um, TLC wants more fat shows and she's like, you need to think of a fat show to pitch to the, to them in, at this conference I'm going to tomorrow. And I was like, okay. And so she left the office and I'm just like trying to think. And I had, I think I had started looking into trans at that point already. Um, and I had like read like the surgeons like requirements and stuff. And there was something that was like, oh, you must be like a certain body weight to um, be able to get um, transgender type surgeries and stuff because um, there's so many things that can go wrong and complications. And so while she was gone, I thought of the TV show Trans Fat about people who were transgender and uh, they needed to lose the weight in order to transition. So it's like a double extreme makeover show. Not only are they like losing all the weight, becoming this new person, they're also flipping genders at the end. So this crazy cool concept and it sold the next day. And so through that show, I had to cast the whole thing myself and I must have interviewed like maybe like 50 people. Um, and so through my interviews with the people, I uh, was asking questions that maybe I had about myself and the answers they were giving me were very much in line with what I was feeling on the inside. And so that was kind of like th a little bit of therapy and even gave me more realization like, hey, like I identify with these people, like I, I'm transgender. So that was kind of my process of coming out to myself as well. So, And I love, yeah. love your coming out, your public coming out yeah. story, how that happened. Oh, uh, yeah. How that kind of, un un I almost said unfooled, uh, yeah. unfolded. 
Yeah. Tell us a little bit about that, how publicly uh, you came out to friends and family. Yeah. So, um, of course, I, I started to come out slowly to, um, you know, some of my best friends. And I wasn't a comedian at the time, um, but I was always making jokes. I was always like, you know, plain practical jokes. And so when I first told people uh, that I was transgender, they're like, uh, haha, very funny. Like my best friends did not believe me because I had made up so many lies in the past about uh, just crazy jokes that took, I, I took too far that they're like, no, you're not. Like you're gonna come back a week later and you're like gonna say, just kidding. Um, but anyway, I did think it would be really funny and kind of safe to come out on April 1st, which we know as April Fool's Day. And so um, on Facebook, I just decided to make a blanket announcement. I changed my name and I, I said, um, you know, I'm transgender, I love y'all. And then, so I got like a bunch of comments and then um, some of my friends that actually did know I was transgender, they were like, leaving joke comments. They're like, haha, April Fool's very funny. So it was just confusing people anymore. But then um, I think people did start to realize um, that I was because I had changed my profile picture to like a more effeminate picture and everything. And like I got, I, I must have got so many, I think I got like over like 100 or 200 comments or likes, which was like a lot more than I was expecting. And just people, um, I was really prepared that day to um, get a lot of backlash and have a lot of people reaching out to me, unfriending me, uh, sending me nasty messages. Uh, just all those people from Texas. Um, and I, I was prepared, you know, for preparing myself for the worst. Um, but in fact, it was actually the opposite. Um, people were very supportive. Everyone that I had ever met, you know, like someone I met on a beach trip, like in middle school, like people reaching out and messaging me like, oh, like I always knew you're a different, like blah, blah, blah. This makes me happy. Teachers reaching out to me. Um, and even my best friend um, from high school who um, I, is like very Republican and everything. He's like, why didn't you just tell me? Like, why have you been keeping this a secret? And I'm like, I don't know. And so I, I, I did have a lot of support the whole time, but I, I didn't realize I would. And a lot of it, I think, was just um, in my head and just, um, you know, f from the way uh, the rhetoric, uh, the rhetoric, uh, the rhetoric people used in Texas growing up, you know, they'd say, that's so gay, or they would make fun of, you know, boys being effeminate and stuff like that. So it, it was all in my head. What did that do for overall self-esteem um, and your ability to move forward in a healthy way to see all of that positive support coming in from friends, family, really from the fringes, from people mm -hmm. that um, just knew you even slightly? What did that do for you? Yeah, so um, when people reached out to me, um, it, it was just very um, validating and affirming and uh, I would say that um, just like still today, it happens all the time. People are like, oh my gosh, like you're so pretty, you're trans or um, people get really confused too. I, I, I'm a, actually a go-go dancer too. I just started doing that uh, in the fall um, at the number one uh, bar, uh, gay bar in, uh, in uh, Palm Springs. And so people will come up and they'll be like, wait, like, which way did you transition? I'm so confused. Like, <laughs> um, I don't know. So yeah, it's just very like an affirming process. So where do you, um, where do you line this or how does your family or did, cause you come out to your family prior to the Facebook post, uh, mm -hmm. what just coming from a super religious background, uh, how did your family take the news? Um, what was good, uh, what was bad, what could they have done better? Yeah, so um, my mom was Catholic and then um, my dad was Protestant. Um, they weren't actually like the most religious people ever. It's just that I turned out really religious because of the school and the church that I went to. Um, and my mom had actually left the church um, during the war. Um, so like around September 11th, um, they were t 
uh, talking in, in like the Texas churches. They're like, oh, like we need to support our troops. But I guess she was a Democrat and she did not support like going to war. And then so when they started to bring politics into the church, she kind of like left. Um, and so then it, uh, they were also divorced. And so then it would if I went to church, it was like just with my dad um, and stuff. But um, anyway, um, how my parents reacted, um, my dad like knew something was wrong. And because um, I, I would I'd get really sad, I'd stay in my room, I would like, um, he, he knew something that was like super off about me. And so he'd kind of ask me um, in college and stuff. And then I think the first time I told him was I had studied abroad in Australia. And that was kind of like my coming out process a little bit, um, just even with my sexual orientation. Um, <laughs> long story short, basically, I went to Australia and um, I ended up uh, ho hooking up with my scuba instructor um, after this like five day excursion. And then I like took a taxi back the next day to the university and it, the taxi drops you off um, right in front of the cafeteria where it's all windows. And so people see me get dropped off in the same outfit I was wearing the night before. The walk and, of shame. And everyone's just like, oh, so you're gay. And I was like, um, I, yeah, I, I, I'm that word <laughs> that you just used. Um, and so that I was kind of forced out of the closet. Um, but uh, yeah, th th that was kind of funny. Anyway, so after Australia, my dad, um, I think like had a talk with me. He's like, hey, so like what's going on with you? And I think I told him that I, I think I might be um, transgender because I did like a lot of like thinking and stuff. But um, and he um, was like, no, I think it's just a phase and just trying to kind of convince me that, oh, that's not a path you want to go down. You know, trans people have it very hard. You know, they can't get jobs. Um, he was very like career focused and um then like another thing he had mentioned he's like oh like if you transition you're never going to find someone to love you like um in like a romantic sense type of thing like and so like he wasn't supportive but it was more kind of like in in my best interest type of way for what he thought was my best interest and um he probably um maybe was uh, embarrassed too like if he would have had to tell his friends and stuff you know he, he every parent wants their kid to succeed they don't want um to be embarrassed or anything by them so that might have been part of it too um and so um he kind of like convinced me to like oh no this isn't you don't want to do that type of thing and so like i i just didn't talk about it um until years and I, I was doing my best to just you know try to fit that mold and, and try being a gay man because that was the lesser evil so yeah that makes a lot of sense and uh, and it's hard to be in that situation and not read between the lines yeah like, try trying to be in those positions and say i am these things though dad like mm -hmm. uh, the, these are <laughs> things that bring me happiness but also like i can understand you um trying to look out for your father's best interests yeah. and, and understand the position he's coming from. But at the same time, you have to say, this is about me too. Maybe there's some, maybe there's some part of it that requires us to be self-centered a little bit mm -hmm. and selfish, which is yeah. so uh, against religious principles in the ideas of mm -hmm. we're supposed to think of other people before we think of ourselves. And, and here you are kind of yeah. struggling on the vine. Well, also back then there was no one to even look at and say this is a, su a successful um, trans story. It's a great back point. then there was no Caitlyn Jenner. Um, there, it was like no G Gigi Gorgia. There was like no trans people like on YouTube or anything like that. So there wasn't anywhere I could even point or have inspiration um, to be like, oh wait, this is, um, I, there is a success story. And then um, I guess I should mention just because I did mention Gigi Gorgeous. Um, so when I was working on that TV show that I had pitched, um, the trans fat show, it actually ended up airing. It was called Too Fat to Transition. I'm so mad they changed that name, but, you know, uh, no control over that. Anyway, so while I was researching doctors for the show, I came across a video uh, by Gigi Gorgeous. And I had seen pictures of her before. Um, we had mutual friends, um, but I didn't realize she was trans. And then I saw her... Um, doing this video about her like transgender surgery and meeting with the surgeon and I was like oh my god like I got so jealous I was like this gorgeous girl looks like Paris Hilton like 
And that, like, I, I'm a big Paris Hilton Britney fan, if you can't tell. Um, and I was like, I got so jealous, and I'm like, oh my gosh, like, and that's the jealousy is like what made me know, like, I'm why am I jealous? It's because I'm trans, and I didn't even realize that you could transition like this and be successful and pass and um, be desirable, you know. Um, and so that that was a big moment for me to confront myself and be like, hey, like you know, I need to work with my feelings. So, yeah. Let's walk down that path of what it looks like to transition. Mm -hmm. um, and, and I know for, for many, this is a really touchy subject. Yeah. There, there's a lot of cautionary points where we get into this story. But I, I also think that it's, it's wise that we have a discussion where we can have kind of an open opportunity to discuss um, what that path looked like for you. Mm -hmm. um, what, was, what was difficult about it? Um, what, what you didn't expect? but also the benefits of it and what that has done for you today. Yeah. Um, so, so first transitioning, um, it, it's different from being gay because being gay, you don't have to really announce it to the world. I mean, you can, if you, if you want to, but it's more just a private thing. You can just go on dates and kind of live your life. And, um, but when you're trans, you have to create a public service announcement. Be like, hey, this is the name I want to go by. If you do change your name, um, not everyone changes their name. Um, and these are the pronouns that I want to be, um, you know, called by, um, you change, you know, all your Facebook, everything. And then, it, so it, it's, it's a big process. You feel a lot of pressure because you're like, oh, how are people going to react to me? Um, like, who am I? I've, I've never, uh, at that point I had lived for 25 years. I had never actually been myself before. I'd been a version. I was playing a role um for other people and so um it was a lot of just inner conflict and like oh am i allowed to be myself what's gonna happen if i show people the real me um and then so once but um once you do transition once you do start to get comfortable um being yourself um it gets easy because you are being yourself and you're not having to think and overcompensate and be this role. And so um, when you ask what it's like to be transgender now, I say um, it, it feels normal. I'm just being my true self now. So um, help our audience understand different levels of transition. I know uh -huh. prior to you coming out on the Facebook post publicly, yeah. um, appearance wise, there were some some things that had changed. Mm -hmm. You said your hair was growing out a little longer, um, more effeminate um, presentation. What are some different levels of transition or stages of transition that is mm -hmm. familiar in this space? Yeah, so um, there's actually a bunch of different levels. I think there's like maybe like 10 or 12. Um, if you meet with like a therapist or something, they'll give you the sheet of all the different phases of your transition. Um, I, I can't name any of them right now, but I mean, everyone goes through the exact same process. Some steps are a lot longer than other ones. Um, I would say transitioning is like that awkward middle school phase, but you're experiencing it. Well, for me, I experienced it as an adult. You're like, I don't know how to do my hair and you like want to just wear pink and bright colors and maybe like you know your lipstick is like the brightest pink ever which makes you stand out more than blend in if you're trying to you know just uh, appear like as um you know as this woman or something but um yeah um there's definitely the awkward middle school phase i mean my hair was growing out um for me um the surgical route was uh, something that was very important to me um, and, and passing because, you know, not only what, did I want to be my true self, I wanted to appear how I, how I felt on the inside, on the outside. And so um, I, I didn't want to look masculine or like a man. I, I didn't want to keep getting misgendered and stuff. And so the surgical route for me was uh, really important in order for me to feel comfortable um, being my true self and to feel validated by the public um, by acknowledging my, um, you know, gender identity. I love it. And so. I and I think that's really an, just an honest, mm -hmm. um, when we talk about authenticity and honesty in episodes like this and in podcast episodes, that's really what we're looking for. We're yeah. looking for someone to 
um, and, and specifically within um, the transgender experience, to be able to match the inside with the outside mm-hmm. and and to feel um, that full measure of creation. Like, of course, to be able to look in the mirror and have the mirror look back and everybody is in agreement. Mm-hmm. And so I think that's that's exciting um, and and that's special. So uh, I mean, a long trip that got you uh, all the way you're 25 years old and finally to the stage where you can feel comfortable in your own skin Mm -hmm. and and start to see who ashley is yeah but i was still very nervous at that point um and so um i did my surgical journey i did three surgeries so like three years in a row i would get major surgery done um and i was still very apprehensive and unsure Um, I was like, wait, what if I like change my mind, which is, um, something that, um, all transgender people have to consider. Like, what if, what if I try it and I don't like it? Like, do I need to take it back? Or, um, cause you hear of people detransitioning, which is a thing. Um, some people, um, have tried it and then they realize, oh, maybe I wasn't transgender. Um, you know, um, that's not a lot of people, but it does happen sometimes. Um, and so I was like, oh. Um, I wanted to be safe when it came to my surgical um, transition. So um, a lot of people, a lot of trans people, they'll actually go and get their breasts done first. But I didn't want to do that because I was so unsure. And so I did all face stuff my first surgery because I was like, oh, well, um, I wanted to kind of change a bunch of things anyway about my face. And so I was like, "Uh, perhaps if I do these things, then I change my mind. You know, they're still going back. So I, I was still just, you know, trying to take slow steps. And then, um, <laughs> and then, so I, I, I got the surgeries on my face and I, I really liked them because, um, I, I went to a really amazing doctor and Beverly Hills. He did, uh, Caitlyn Jenner. He has like over a year or two long wait list to get in. And, um, he, so not only does he change your features to be more feminine, they give you like the full celebrity, like the the looks that everyone wants. And I'm like, oh, it's such a good feeling to get this surgery and just see yourself in the mirror and everything. But um, then I didn't get, I didn't get breasts until my second surgery. And I I got my second surgery pretty quick because um, I was actually living with a a roommate at the time who also ended up uh, transitioning. And then she got boobs and she started to get a bunch of attention from guys. And I was like, I want that attention. And so, (laughs) and so then uh, I, I, again, I was jealous. And so I'd say jealousy, um, kind of played a role in getting me to transition. Cause I was like, why am I jealous of her? It's because I want this for myself. And so, um, cause I was still very uncomfortable with being myself and very just unsure and indecisive. Um, I'm an indecisive person. So <laughs> when it comes to, um, yeah. your work yeah. and your profession, how did that world, um, treat, the transitioning, Ashley, the different stages as you were navigating that world? Yeah. Um, transitioning um, professionally is very difficult. A lot of people lose their jobs and stuff. And um, I ended up uh, finish, uh, wrapping the um, trans fat show. And then um, my company got rid of their American division. And so I was left without a job and I was um, going on job interviews during my awkward middle school phase of like, um, before I had surgery, I wasn't passing, um, and me like trying to wear makeup and trying to kind of dress like a woman a little bit and going on these job interviews, which was just awkward because people like weren't sure what I was and I was not kind of comfortable with myself. And so just a lot, a lot of awkward job interviews, um, and rejection and, at that point, I wasn't even sure, uh, what I wanted to do with my career or what kind of producer I wanted to be. Um, hindsight, I really wanted to be in front of the camera, but I was, I wasn't confident yet. Um, but yeah, so a lot of uncertainty and, and I got kind of desperate at some points. I started applying for jobs that weren't even in, in television. So I went down to Rodeo drive. I was like, Oh, wouldn't it be nice to like work at, um, you know, East Saint Laurent or, um, Louis Vuitton. Um, and I ended up getting a lot of job interviews cause they actually really liked those stores, liked the transgender people. Um, I just didn't have a fashion background. And so East Saint Laurent, they were like, oh, like, tell us what's your like, fav- who was your favorite, um, East Saint Laurent designer? 
Um, and I was just like, um, I, I, I like shoes. Like, I didn't have anything. <laughs> the pink to, ones. I didn't have any of the background um, uh, studies or anything like that. I'm like, oh, I like expensive things. Um, <laughs> uh, but then I got really far with Louis Vuitton and I didn't get it right at the end um, just because I didn't have any retail experience. I had never worked service before. Um, I had just worked at a uh, front desk at a hair salon and a uh, tanning salon. Like, you know, that, those were my like first jobs and stuff. So, um, yeah, anyway, I ended up uh, getting into reality TV and going back to one of the first jobs I had out of, out of college uh, with popular productions, you know, uh, the only company in the world that I could possibly work for. <laughs> but yeah, I'm still working with them today. And uh, they were they created the Jersey Shore in Rich Kids of Beverly Hills, um, working uh, for my boss, Durano Fier. So it's kind of a fun company to be in because I was such a huge fan of, um, you know, those shows. So let's talk about it. I think this is a fascinating part of the interview. Yeah. <laughs> we get we get the difficult stuff behind yeah. us. Let's talk about the fun stuff, reality okay. TV and and casting and and the whole production side of of what you're doing cuz I I think that's the Ashley Ryan that most people know now. Yeah, so um I started to kind of rebrand myself um as a comedian. Um I actually, so when I transitioned and got to a point, I, I didn't start going on dates and stuff until I think after I had my second surgery and I felt comfortable, like, oh, I have breasts um, now and I, I can feel comfortable going on dates and feeling um, just more comfortable in my body. And so I went on a date with a guy on Bumble and we went uh, to a beautiful uh, French restaurant and had like frog legs on like Sunset Boulevard. And then we walked over to the comedy store. Um, and he was a comedian. We got to skip the line and got a table. And I had never seen like a comedy show in person before. And so I was really excited. Um, and, you know, any person going to a comedy show, like whether you're, you know, you're Jewish or black or whatever, like, you know, you're going to get made fun of at some point. And so you're in preparing yourself for these jokes. I'm like, okay, I'm trans. What are they going to have to say about trans people? What are these trans jokes that are going to come? Like, am I going to be embarrassed? Am I going to think it's funny? Um, and so I, I was really excited for it. And then um, they had a bunch of different comedians go up. It was a full showcase. And then someone, I think he, he was like a celebrity type of um, comedian um, who I should know, but I, I can't remember his name. He went up and he had a trans joke. It was about Caitlyn Jenner. And um, the the punchline was that he used the word he instead of she and people like laughed and stuff and i was like that is your trans joke like that's not even funny like and i'm like i i felt like i was way funnier than all the comedians were to be quite honest and i'm like and, and literally from that day and from that date i went up and signed up for comedy classes like the next week i was like i can do this i'm funny and I want to tell my story. And um, yeah, now, then, then I got really into comedy and I've been doing it ever since. And um, yeah, I also work as a casting director. And so doing that as my full-time job. And uh, now I go-go dance and now I flip houses too. Um, I have an, a commercial agent. So I have like five jobs. <laughs> it's like You're busy. Really busy. Yeah. Tell us about the uh, tell us about the reality show you're casting now. Um, yeah, attention, all Mormon virgins. <laughs> yeah, so right now um, I am working on a TV show called Never Have I Ever. Um, it is for a major streaming service. I can't say uh, exactly which one on the air right now, um, but it is for one of the top two streaming services. Um, oh, what is that noise? Oh, that's my computer. Oh, sorry. <laughs> I was like, are you playing some mood music for my... <laughs> that's, uh, that's another episode that's starting right now. It's playing. And that's the Facebook, the YouTube, like the 45 second intro. Yeah. <laughs> porn music. Okay. All right. We'll start. Let me go back. Yeah. All right, so tell us about what you're casting now. Yeah. Um, attention all so Mormon I'm casting, virgins. Yeah, so I'm casting a very exciting new dating show called Never Have I Ever. It is for a major streaming service, one of the top two. I can't say which one, is, but, but it's one of the top two. Um, anyway, it's very exciting because it's a dating show 
featuring all virgins or born again virgins. Um, you know, virgin, we mean by whatever you define that as. Um, you know, therefore, so if you identify as a gay person, but you've had straight sex before, but never had gay sex before, um, you can be on our show. Um, that is a type of virgin. Um, if you were um, married and had sex, um, but then, you know, got divorced or got widowed, something happened and you haven't had sex since, um, that is a born again virgin. We accept stories like that. Um, we also are accepting stories of like, you know, trans people who have had sex before um, and then got gender reassignment surgery and haven't had sex yet. Um, so um, there's a lot of different definitions of a virgin we're looking for. But this show is super exciting um, because it would be like a resort uh, style show. Um, so it'd definitely be a pool of people. Um, everyone's in the same boat. Um, you know, you're in the same playing field uh, dating people who are either virgins or born again virgins and want to focus on, you know, um, intimacy and relationships and everything. Um, and I think it's just a very much needed show. I can't believe there's never been a virgin dating show before. Um, I think there's still a lot of stigma, uh, especially for men losing their virginity later in life. And I just, this show's so exciting to get to talk about openly and confidently about that. And I, I think it's gonna address a lot of important things like, no, there's nothing wrong with losing your virginity whenever you feel comfortable. Maybe you need to get into that first loving relationship. And um, yeah, just exciting show. <laughs> I'm interested in, I'm just yeah. wondering how how is going trying to source a gay or LGBTQ virgin market? It just doesn't seem like there's yeah. a plethora of candidates with things like yeah. Grindr <laughs> yeah. out there that exist. Well, we're casting all virgins. It's not just gay. Um, we're looking at doing like, pods on the show. So um, we'll have uh, bisexual people mixed in who will go on dates with all people, um, you know, pansexual, and then we'll have gay pods as well. Um, and a lot of the gay stories have been people who um, have just come out or coming out later in life. Um, and it, it's going a lot better than I, I thought it would be um, for uh, gay people who haven't had sex yet. And, you know, a lot of people have like done foreplay and stuff and messed around, but haven't gone all the way. Um, and so I'm just getting some really amazing stories. It's exciting. So yeah. someone who says to themselves, I could find my life, some excitement on a resort. Yeah, so if someone would like to apply to the show, um, you can either send me a DM on Instagram. Uh, my handle is at Ashley Ryan TV. Um, also, um, or you can apply directly to our application on the website. It is neverhaveiever.castingcrane.com. Um, that application link is also currently on my Instagram. Um, I think we're gonna be casting all the way um, to the end of April. Uh, maybe the second week of May we'll be casting till. Um, it's a 12 week process, so there's still a lot of time. Um, you can apply for yourself, or if you want to DM me, maybe someone you want to recommend for the show, um, but you're too shy to tell them, um, we do that as well. Just send us their contact information. Uh, we will reach out. Um, but again, uh, this is a cool opportunity because, you know, it would be like uh, most likely a four to six week commitment of you living at in a resort style um, atmosphere and doing nothing but focusing on just your love life, which so many of us, you know, we're focused on career or hiding for two years because of a pandemic. <laughs> and so it's such a, a cool time to have this. And um, I should also mention this is international. So um, we're casting Canada, USA, UK, Australia, uh, you know, just mostly the main English uh, speaking um, countries. So um, very exciting. Um, you do need to have a passport. Um, the production company is based in the UK. Um, and uh, I don't, we don't, don't have a location yet, but um, it's going to be somewhere awesome. So, And call me crazy, Yeah. but do I remember you on Bravo's Below Deck? Yeah. So I was on Below Deck um, as a, a guest of the main charter guest um, in 2020, um, which it aired in November of 2020, 
which was really funny because um, if you remember November 2020, it was deep pandemic. Everything was shut down. People lost their jobs. Um, you know, everyone's posting on Facebook like, oh my God, I can't get toilet paper. Oh my God, like my unemployment check hasn't come yet. I don't know what I'm going to do. And I'm like, oh my God, I'm on Bravo tonight. Tune in tonight, eight, nine o'clock, eight central to watch me and my friends go yachting on Bravo TV. And it's really funny because we shot uh, the show in February of 2020. Um, bef like when the pandemic was like still a joke and um, it hadn't actually hit the US yet, it was hitting all these other countries and there was no masks. Uh, they, they were actually telling people not to wear masks at that point. They're like, don't buy masks, we, you don't need them, they don't do anything. Um, and so we had like brought um, masks to the airport like as a joke, like this was like before like the pandemic. And um, then when we were like on the yacht, um, there was like headlines, like that stuff was happening in other countries. And I, I said a joke to the staff. I was like, oh, I think we might, I'm kind of feeling sick. We might have to be quarantined on this yacht for two weeks. <laughs> so um, yeah, and then uh, long story short, we were the first charter for the season for that TV show. I, they, I think maybe they usually do like, you know, six to 10 charters. They had to cut it short um, because the pandemic, uh, they wouldn't let people fly into the, to the island anymore. Um, everything went into full shutdown mode. And so they ended up cutting the season short. So we got more airtime. We got three episodes instead of just one and a half or two. Um, so that was really exciting. To um, And I had never been on the yacht before. Oh, my God. Like living the life. I didn't realize people live like that. Oh, my gosh. A best... Uh, best vacation of 2020, I should say. <laughs> Time to create another another reality show. Yeah, I'm so ready to the create gays another. Go yachting. Where gays go yachting? <laughs> well, that kind of was my group. Oh my gosh, there was a, there was a lot of real drama that actually did happen on that. Really funny. <laughs> uh, no surprise, not surprised yeah. at all. Super fascinating story. Uh, first, thank you, thank you for sitting down and and sharing some of your story and mm -hmm. letting the audience get to know uh, you and your experience a little better and and maybe even better understanding what it's like to be transgender just a little bit more uh, than they did prior to this episode. What didn't we talk about that you wanted to talk about? Is there something that you think uh, this audience should know about you, your experience, about this space? Um, that is a good question. Uh, did we talk enough about religion or like, do, do we ever talk enough about religion? <laughs> religion talks so much about us. Um, uh, are we talking enough about oh, religion? Yeah, no. Um, like, do you, uh, did you like want to see where I am? Like with my sure, religion great. now? Yeah. Great. Um, like through transitioning. Yeah. And so, um, I, I would have to say like, um, how I, I guess when it comes to religion and, um, my journey to self-discovery, um, you know, being my true authentic self. Um, at first when I was in college and like experimenting with being gay and everything, um, I was still very much religious. I, um, worked at a Christian, uh, high adventure summer camp in Yosemite national park. Uh, um, it was so, it was the best experience of my life. Way more fun to be a camp counselor than it is to be a camper. Um, anyway, um, I, I would still like pray and um like ask god like for help and like um but then i started to like be inclu inclusive of god and just being very honest be like hey like i'm gay like i'm praying for this date i want this date to go well whatever um and so i started to become more open and everything through it um and then i i guess later um when i moved to west hollywood and i started to become more um gay and openly gay and dating gay people um, I encountered a lot of uh, people who were very much against religion. And um, if I mentioned like anything about Christianity or God, people would get upset and they would call me out on stuff. And I was just like, oh, like, why are these people like so upset about like religion and stuff? So I, I was still kind of um, dealing with um, escaping the bubble that I grew up in and, um, you know, all the um, like having to unlearn conditions that I was taught growing up. And um, then I really started to um, just open up my mind and think about just religion. And, uh, you know, I, I matured. And so I started to have just more open and 
um, honest conversations with myself. And it actually wasn't until I met a gay ex-Mormon that he was, I was very curious. I was like, oh my gosh, like, uh, what is the Mormon religion like? What was that like growing up like a gay Mormon? Because I knew that like I was a missionary. I, I went on like little mission trips for like two weeks at a time. I went to, you know, Peru, uh, Guatemala, Mexico. Um, but I knew that the Mormons were like very intense with like their two year commitment uh, with their, um, you know, going on mission trips. And so I wanted to know everything. And then he was like telling me like a little bit about the religion and like about, um, you know, like the planets and uh, maybe like a little bit of extra, uh, extraterrestrial type or uh, celestial like type beliefs you guys have, right? Uh, uh, what? Who? Us? Yeah. Or, or all the, the celestial, people. terrestrial, and telestial kingdoms. Yeah. And yes. I was just like, and oh my. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and I was just like, oh my God, like, how can people believe stuff like this? Like, blah, blah, blah. Like, how did you fall for that? And then he just like named like uh, all this stuff in the Bible, like, really quick. He's like, oh, Jesus walked on water, blah, 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 blah. Like, all these like crazy things that we believe, like, most part of like the water and like, blah, I, I, just all that stuff. And then I just paused and I was just like, oh my God, my mind just blew. I was like, I'm that person that I was just making fun of her. I'm like, I couldn't believe. And that, that's when I realized, I was like, wait, I feel like some brainwashing happened here. And then I just really started to delve into the um, questions I've always had as a Christian growing up um, and just really dissect them. And just any feelings that I had where I was uncomfortable with the church, um, I finally confronted those feelings. And so, for example, um, you know, just growing up in the church, um, anytime uh, you have a question, you, you ask it. You're like, oh, like, what does God think about this? And so I would ask questions. I'd be like, what is God? Um, we're taught that you can only get into heaven if you believe in Jesus, that he died on the cross for your sins. And so I'd be like, what happens if you are in a tribe in the jungle in Africa? Uh, not, I don't even think there's jungles in Africa, but <laughs> like, what if you're in the middle of nowhere and like, you never heard like the gospel, like, do you just, like, we're taught that like you like go to hell and you burn in hell and your skin's on fire and you're in pain for all eternity. That's what I was taught in the Lutheran church. Um, and so they would just like give us generic answers. They'd be like, oh, well, the Bible says that in this verse that, um, you know, we're not supposed to know the answers to everything or um, we'd be like, what happens to children if they die before they can talk? And they're like, oh, all God's children go to heaven. And so they would always have like these like loop, uh, like walk arounds for the really hard questions. Um, and then, and so another, so the biggest question for me was like, just for people like, wait, so you're saying that everyone who doesn't believe Jesus died on the cross for your sins goes uh, to hell and burns like for all eternity. And that never sat right for me. I was like, wait, I was taught that God was a God of love and a God of love does not send people who were born in a Muslim country where it is the law that you have to be Muslim, where it is uh, you're not allowed to have Bibles or illegal. It didn't sit right with me that all those people have to go to hell just because of where they were born. And so that was a huge red flag to me. And then just going back and, um, you know, studying and understand where religion came from. And, you know, Christianity was very much law, like the kings, like, forced it on people and stuff. Um, and there, I actually had another friend who, um, he uh, was brought into a cult and he escaped from the cult and just viewing after hearing his story like all the similarities um to, that i had felt were in um the, not just the christian faith but all faiths it's you know they all say you can have no other gods they all say um this is the only way to heaven you have to believe this religion or else you can't get into heaven and by the way, we want all your money. Um, <laughs> those were the ma three major red flags that were like, made me really uncomfortable. Like, well, 
not only do I not believe, I'm, I'm no longer comfortable with Christianity. I'm not comfortable with any organized religion. And now I'm to the point, I do, I'm very spiritual. I believe that we're all connected. You know, um, that feeling you have when you're thinking about someone on the other side of the country and they call you five seconds later, we all have experienced that. Um, but at the end of the day, I've gotten to the point where I'm just like, you know what? None of us know what happens to us when we die. None of us have actually died. Your beliefs are just your beliefs. And that's what it's meant to be. Like, you don't, even if you decide to follow a religion, it's still your, your personal choice. It's your belief. You don't, you don't have to listen to what any, anything that anyone else tells you. Um, and I like to think that um, we all have a purpose and that we all, that our purpose is on this earth is greater than just hoping that we end up following the correct religion so that we can get into heaven. And so I think we all have a greater purpose. And so for me, uh, my purpose is very much uh, change, acceptance and uh, making the path easier for other people. Um, I feel that my purpose is, you know, putting my story out there in hopes that someone else can relate to it or that people who aren't even transgender, you know, um, just normal cis people, Republicans, whatever, um, can relate to me. And so that's what I feel like my purpose is uh, just change um, through my spirit. And so that is um, how my religion has kind of changed. But now I, I don't know what's going to happen when I die. I hope that, um, you know, of course, my spirit will continue on. And, um, you know, whatever happens, happens. You will draw closer to your idols like Britney Spears and yes. Paris Hilton. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. Thank you. Thank you for sharing your story. Um, yeah. Thank you for being open and candid and honest and real and and willing to answer a few hard questions, but also mm -hmm. have a little fun. And I think uh, in this space, I mean, thank you for being visible mm -hmm. in, in all those spaces, not only just in reality television and in Hollywood and that scene, but in, in real life, just owning and honoring who and what you are. I think that's commendable. Awesome. Thank you. That's hot. <laughs> Thank you. So um, often we have people who will watch these episodes and want to reach out and yeah. ask questions. Mm -hmm. um, we have both the audio and the video podcast, so people are likely going to ask questions or respond um, online. Are you willing to answer some of those questions if they leave some remarks below? Yeah, I'm definitely um, willing to answer people's questions. And yes, I am single. <laughs> <laughs> that seems to be a, a new trend lately on this ep on these podcast episodes. I think the last four or five has been this yeah. uh, this call for companionship. So. Yeah, if you are a lumberjack and have a really nice beard, reach out to me. <laughs> and a job if oh you have a gosh. job too. <laughs> I'm cutting you off. I'm cutting you off right now. <laughs> I'm not casting for a relationships on this podcast. Okay. <laughs> Exciting. Thank you. Um, thank you again for sharing your story. Thank you for being here and, and for all that you're doing for the uh, LGBTQ community um, and for visibility again, just letting people get to better understand uh, our personal experiences. Awesome. Thank you for having me. It's another episode on Latter Gay Stories podcast. Thank you for joining us. Thank you for giving us an hour of your time to better understand uh, Ashley's experience and the experiences of others. If you uh, have a question for Ashley, um, she is willing to answer some of these, some of your questions. If you want to leave them in the chat below here on uh, the Facebook or YouTube video, or if you are listening on the audio version, uh, jump over to our social media where we have this episode posted and you can ask your questions there. And, or like Ashley said, she's on Instagram. So you can reach out to uh, Ashley via Instagram um, and maybe even catch her in some of these uh, comedy skits as well. We should take off and head to California soon. <laughs> but again, thank you for uh, supporting the Latter Gay Stories podcast for helping us build bigger and stronger bridges between the LDS and LGBTQ community. But thank you more importantly to the individual um, LGBTQ person who shows up every day and uh, shows up there with their very uh, honest and authentic self and is visible in our community. I want you to know that you're not alone. You're not broken. 
and that your best days are ahead. There's a whole community of people here to support you. And in terms of support, thank you to our many listeners uh, who do support the Latter Gay Stories podcast by sharing episodes like this, uh, financially supporting the podcast, and for being there for the LGBTQ community. It's stories like Ashley's and yours that help us each continue to write our own Latter Gay Story.